With a sustainable energy action plan, uh, you can initiate a strategy in your community, but it can also represent a real challenge in the planning and implementation and in monitoring phase. So let's now turn our focus into practical guidance and, and share some support options. Uh, and we will hear three speakers who will share their perspectives on hand and have a Q&A at the end. So my first speaker is an expert in financial instruments in the environmental and energy sector at both the national and the EU level. Uh, working at the engineering consultancy, he's been involved in se several local projects focusing on sustainable energy planning and the covenant, covenant of mayors. And he's also someone who li likes to get his hands dirty because he's currently involved in, in development more than 20 uh, sustainable energy action plans. So welcome our next speaker, Marco De Vetta. All right. My name is Marco De Vetta. I guess you know almost everything you need to know about me. I work with Sujeska, and yes, we've been involved in many, many sustainable energy action plans so far. Some of them are over, some of them are still ongoing, and have challenges to, um, to be overcome. Um, in my presentations today, I would like to briefly go through the requirements of the Covenant of Mayors, just in case some of you don't know uh, what they are. And then I would like to go through the planning of the process, as a sustainable energy action plan is a process. And then I um, would like to go through 10 steps in which I divided the planning of a sustainable energy action plan with some hints they might uh, would like to hear. And then some do's and don'ts and my contact at the end. I have to say that uh, my original presentation was made of about 50 slides, but then I was told that uh, I would have only 12 minutes to go through them, and also nobody ever complained about the speech being too short. So uh, I guess I cut most, uh, almost half of them. There you go. So the Covenant of Mayors, if you don't know, um, is a European initiative and it's a voluntary initiative in which municipalities can um, commit to prepare a baseline CO2 emission inventory, then submit an action plan with a goal to reduce emissions by at least 20% by 2020, of course in the areas where a local government can act. And then um, a municipality should adapt city structures in order to be able to <coughs> implement the action plan when it's ready. And then civil society should be involved at all time and as much as possible. And of course, a local government signing the covenant of mayors should also commit to the organization of energy days to show the population, the people, what is happening. And... Um, while s when signing uh, the Covenant of Mayors, uh, local government commits to submit an action plan within 12 months of the date of the signature. But uh, be aware that the city council's approval, the city council's decision, the date of the city council's decision is the date that counts. And I have seen a couple of municipalities lately um, they didn't sign, they told me that they hadn't signed the Covenant of Mayors yet, but their city council's decision was taken 12 months ago. So basically, it's like they had signed the Covenant of Mayors already and the time available had expired. And then, of course, there is the monitoring of the action plan and the Covenant of Mayors office requires uh, to show a monitoring report every two years um, every second year after the conclusion of the action plan and submission of the action plan. And what is an action plan, a sustainable energy action plan? It's a document that includes a baseline emission inventory of the emissions in the municipal territory, a clear vision of what should be done of the sectors where intervention is most needed, and then a set of actions to reduce CO2 emissions by 2020, by at least 
a sustainable energy action plan it's not an it's not an energy plan it's an action plan so it's a group of actions that leads you to the reduction of co2 emissions and then of course there should be resource planning that is allocated staff capacity and financial sources to be successful a sustainable energy action plan should have political support from the very beginning. It's not just a technical matter, of course. It should involve as many municipal departments as possible. It shouldn't be just the environmental office that takes care, that takes care of planning and preparing a sustainable energy action plan. It should include local stakeholders of all kinds, from as many uh, types of organizations as possible and from the very beginning and of course it shouldn't be approached as a project so an activity with a beginning and an end it should be approached as a process well there are many things to be done in the planning and then in the in the development of an action plan there is the council's decision there is internal organization there is involvement of stakeholders there is the development of the baseline emission inventory. There is the understanding and the planning of an overall strategy. There is resource planning and allocation, and then the council's approval. As you can see, stakeholders should be involved at all time, but also the council's decision in a possible uh, timeline might not be at the very beginning. It might be after two months, three months, four months, into the process. Nobody says that a municipality cannot work and plan an action plan and prepare a sustainable energy action plan without the council's decision in the beginning. We can begin and then decide to join the covenant. And then of course implementation, which will take potentially forever. And then the 10 steps in which I divided the sustainable energy action plan process, that is the decision to develop a SEP, that is a political decision, of course, that needs um, a long-term perspective which politicians should have to give the mandate to technicians to develop the technical work. And of course, if you are representing municipality and haven't signed the covenant yet, then the covenant of mayor's office and the following presentations will also lead you to, to this action. And of course, there are also events that are organized, because sometimes mayors like to go to Brussels to sign publicly the covenant of mayors, and that is also something they deserve. It's, it's an action that takes uh, courage. It's a long-term decision, therefore visibility is also something that should be cached here. Adaptation of municipal structures, that is something that a municipal, a, a local government should do in order to be prepared, not only for the initial part of the process, which is the planning, but also for the later part, which is the most engaging and the most relevant, which is the implementation of the SEAP. And as I mentioned uh, before, different sectors and departments <coughs> should be involved. Not make it, don't make it just an energy sector thing. Budget office should be involved. Public works office should be involved. Local Agenda 21 offices should be involved. Public relation offices should be involved. This is something that should involve the whole local government as much as possible. You will need all the expertise, all the contacts that you have within the local government. As I work for a consultancy and engineering company, I don't represent the point of view of a local government. I don't represent the point of view of a technician within the local government, nor I am a politician. But I work with many different municipalities, so I might not have the internal point of view, but I have many different I have had experience with many different types of local governments, which has been interesting. And I've seen that all of them need this type of comprehensive and systemic approach. 
Involvement of stakeholders, that is also something that needs to be taken under consideration very well from the very beginning, because if a local government acted only on what is its consumption of energy, then any baseline emission inventory shows that the local government could influence only a small part, directly influence only a small part of the emission, just a two, three, four, five percent of the energy consumption in a municipal territory. But indirectly, it can do much more. So stakeholders should be involved because they can complement that four or five percent of energy reduction that a local government could um, reach by itself. Then, then there is the development of the baseline emissions inventory. You need to know where you start from to decide where you want to go and how you want to get there. Um, so this is an important part of the action planning and it should, if possible, involve stakeholders as well, at least for information purposes, but also if you can get uh, extra data from stakeholders, then that will help your work as well. And then, once you know where the CO2 emissions are produced, then, then the local governments, the politicians and the technicians together should decide which are the sectors where to work on, what to work on, and um, where to focus their attention the most. And in this case as well, meeting with stakeholders uh, should be organized as well, in my opinion, because it helps them to propose sectors of engagement, sectors of action. And then there is the development of the action plan, which needs to be coherent with the overall strategy that has been decided. And as I said, it's not an, a SEAP is not an energy plan, it's an action plan. So um, focus on single actions that will reduce CO2 emissions. Resource planning is also very important. It should involve human resources because it will take time and financial resources because as a, for, as a presentation that will uh, take place later on, money, money, money is the issue. Stakeholders should also be invited and take financial responsibility. And then the finalization of the SEAP, that, uh, that of course is a public document, so it should be in your national language, but there should also be an English part that we'll see later. And then political approval is also important. A council's decision comes at the beginning. A council's decision should, should also come at the end to give political strength to the implementation of the action plan. And then, once the SEAP is ready, it needs to be submitted to the Covenant of Mayors, of course, and there is a template in English and uh, a lot of information on the Covenant of Mayors website. And then implementation. If in the planning part of the process you have done your homework, then implementation will be easier with human resources and financial resources well allocated, or at least predicted. Internal and external communication should also be foreseen to let people in the municipality understand what is happening and let the population, the people, the stakeholders know that you are actually implementing the actions. Monitoring should also be taken very well under consideration. Monitoring and reporting because every second year after the uh, submission of the SEP, you're asked to report to the um, Covenant of Mayor's Office what you're doing and there will be guidelines next year. And this is an opportunity for, municipal, for local gov governments who are, which already do it, then it's okay. But if you were not used, and I've seen many municipalities, small municipalities in, in Italy, they were not used to do that. Um, if you're not used to keeping track of your energy consumption, then this is the monitoring obligation is the right occasion to structure internally to do that and to be able to do that. 
because a minus 20% CO2 emissions by 2020 is a very, very, very complicated goal to reach. And we need to be uh, skeptical about the, the possibility to reach it. But still, do everything that we can to do that. And finally, our uh, SEP mates um, coming from outside the local government, I see this very much, but I, all the people I work with in local government tell me the same thing. It's, there are two main characters, main, two main groups of characters in this game. The politician that has little time, a lot of decision-making responsibilities, and sometimes no technical skills of knowledge. And then there is the technician. M maybe they have more time, maybe. They have no decision-making opportunities, but they do have technical skills and knowledge. So these two groups have to work together in order to accomplish the development of a sound, sustainable energy action plan and a good implementation. And then I have a list of do's and don'ts. Some of them are, all of them are very real. Some of them are funny, but there was no time to include the list here. But you can find it in the online training module by Covenant Capacity uh, Project, which will be soon, very soon online. So don't miss that, because you might make a laugh or two. And, uh, well, Thank you so I'd much. I'd say this is it. I'm an avid keep, keeper of the clock. Uh, Oops, we'll hear more from cool. you uh, in just a minute where you'll join us on stage. But first, two other speakers. Uh, and the next speaker runs the Brussels Office of Climate Alliance, the European City Network committed to local climate policy. And she's been engaged in local climate initiatives, uh, energy initiatives forever. She's a known figure in the capital of Europe. Uh, she's worked in the field of sustainability in Brussels for more than a decade now. A warm hand to Perita Lindholm. Welcome. Six. Okay, works. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, I will first uh, uh, give a kind of a state of play of the Covenant of Mayors initiative now and also then talk about the helpers and the support that we provide within the initiative. Um, well, my task is easier because of the previous speaker, so I can just uh, go quite quickly some of my first slides. But maybe just to highlight once more that the Covenant of Mayors in is an is initiative of the European Commission, DT Energy. And the objective of the initiative was really to uh, give space for local authorities to show that local authorities are an important partner if Europe wants to achieve its uh, EU uh, energy and climate objectives. So it is a no voluntary commitment to reduce CO2 me emissions at least 20% by 2020 by uh, putting in place a, a sustainable energy action plan. This shows um, in another way what the previous speaker was explaining of uh, kind of the steps or the, the formal requirements of, of, the, of the covenant of mayors. So it's first the signatory, uh, first the, there's the political commitment by the municipal council, then in one year the sustainable energy action plan with an, a baseline emission inventory and then followed by regular uh, monitoring uh, by having an implementation report every second year. This shows the, the, the uh, let's say, the success of, of the Covenant of Mayors initiative. Actually, today there are more than 4,200 4, signatories uh, within the Covenant. 
Um, as I was asked to talk uh, about about uh, the the kind of support and and given by um, by the Covenant Affairs Office, of course, here you can see below there are uh, 170 supporting regions, provinces, and networks. This is one of the success factors of the Covenant of Mayors as well. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, regions, provinces that are supporting the the smaller municipalities to to develop and uh, and putting in place their sustainable energy action plans. So um, together, this uh, helps us to 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 actually reach the the achievements necessary. So some figures of where we are today. Um, already mentioned the more than uh, 4,000 signatories. There are now more than 1,700 sustainable energy action plans that are being implemented. Um, you can also see that the cities, municipalities uh, commit to quite a, a larger number of more CO2 emissions than 20 by 2020, so it's approximately 28% by 2020. Um, and they put in place uh, comprehensive actions in different sectors, as the previous speaker also mentioned. This is an action plan and uh, the idea in an ideal situation the local authorities will have actions in their action plans on uh, on building sector on renewable energy on transport on planning on procurement uh, working with the citizens and uh, and also there are quite some some plans that uh, also have actions on in the waste sector So this shows the the kind of um, um, let's say the situation with the with the action plans and how how where we are uh, currently now. Maybe just to say that um, some of you that are aware of the are aware of the the more aware of the Covenant of Mayors initiative. So there are more than 1,700 plans submitted, and there are now some 600 that are are either um, uh, being evaluated or being evaluated. I also wanted to highlight this, um, the model that we have uh, within the Covenant of Mayors. I think it's very, very relevant. And one of the, the, uh, the reasons for its success is that there's the institutional support. So all the EU institutions are supporting this initiative. We uh, have what I mentioned earlier, the territorial coordinators and a lot of committed sub covenant supporters like, like ICLE here. And then we have uh, links with the technical developments via different, uh, because we have quite intense uh, cooperation with initiatives uh, uh, mentioned here, like uh, smart cities or, or, or other, other different projects uh, carried out at the EU level. We have um, financial support that uh, we'll discuss uh, later. And uh, finally, of course, we have the Covenant of Mayor's Office, which is the kind of a contact point for, for, for the Covenant signatories. This is an office uh, run by five local government networks, and I'm working for, for one of those, that, as mentioned earlier, Climate Alliance. And we are, uh, our team is responsible, uh, together with the Joint Research Centre of the Covenant Help Desk. So we are uh, the contact point for when cities want to join the Covenant, helping you to, to go through the, the different procedures. And, and once, you are, uh, once you have signed, we also give you technical support um, related to, to the different uh, requirements. We are also developing together with the Joint Research Centre the kind of the whole framework, the methodological framework for the Covenant. So uh, we have, um, uh, well, I suppose uh, many of you already know the, the guidebook that we've prepared um, that helps you to, to develop the, the baseline emission inventory and setup. We are also developing different types of, of, of uh, um, support materials like uh, this is a uh, pretty new um, brochure helping you kind of a s from commitment to action so really looking at the setup 
giving some ideas on on how we which type of approaches some some local authorities have taken in their steps and their baseline emission inventories. You can find all these materials in your own language uh, in in the Covenant website. I took maybe just to 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 remind you all here these eligibility criteria. So basically, it is uh, that. The plan has to be has to be have to be accepted by a municipal council or, or equivalent body. There has to be, to be clear uh, reference and, and uh, actions that support the 20% CO2 reduction target. The baseline emission inventory has to include three sectors, at least three sectors, and the uh, action plan has to include at least two sectors. But of course, um, this is, these are the kind of minimum criteria, and we also always uh, encourage the, the local authorities to have a very comprehensive and, and, uh, and integrated view in their action plan. Then there are some checks to look at the, that the data is coherent and, and correct and so on. What happens after is interesting. Um, it's that we have a tool which is the called the online catalog. This allows all the Covenant signatories to have their own web page. So this is the kind of their own um, little publicity website where they can, where they, uh, everyone can see the key parts of their action plan. So this is the kind of, uh, yeah, gives nice visibility. And then uh, there's also the feedback report that will be sent to all um, signatories which, uh, with some, some um, highlights and, and some small recommendations for the, for, for the future. This is a, a graph that shows a bit, um, uh, maybe results per sector is not a good title, it's breakdown of, of what, what is expected if you look at the the low, if you look at the sustainable energy action plans. So you can see here that quite a bunch of actions are done within the uh, municipal, with the, within the, the building sector. I think it's almost, uh, well, it's, it's between 30 and 40 percent. Then you can see that transport sector is about 20 percent and also renewables and local energy uh, production is about 20. So just this is an idea to give you an idea uh, what is happening and also to let you know that in the future our objective is to, to uh, develop something called Covenant in Figures where we can really see in more detail of, of, of both the planned um, actions and, and, and also in the future follow the, the results that we receive from the monitoring phase. Now I'm just quickly going to back to some of the support and promotional issues that we are doing. Um, one of the, the first uh, uh, new developments that we have is uh, something called Benchmarks of Excellence. Um, this has been now changed into something more um, linked to the actions in the action plans and also the objectives is to, to draw some conclusions of those uh, measures, looking at their energy savings, CO2, sa CO2 emission reduction, costs, and possibly also uh, things like job creation. We, we all know that uh, the issues related to um, the economic crisis is, is uh, kind of um, an issue for everyone, so we have to also try to show that these actions, these measures done by local authorities, these really contribute to the, chi to the debate on the green economy. So this is a, an important part of our work. Um, we have just launched an e-learning platform. This is available for all, all signatories, coordinators, supporters, and it's available in the in the Covenant Extranet, so our uh, um, uh, members, let's say, uh, we website. Um, there are seven models uh, looking at the different steps of the, coven of the, of the re Covenant requirements. So how to start, uh, how to prepare a s uh, baseline emission in inventory, how to prepare an action plan, ideas on, on good measures, 
uh, financing and so on. So you can uh, have a look at that. Um, maybe just to say that this is now available in English, but it will be available in, in, in five other languages, including, um, um, I think, Italian, Spanish, French, um, uh, German and Romanian. Not Bulgarian, sorry. <laughs> um, and then finally, I would just like to, to highlight uh, that we do organize a lot of different events, uh, thematic workshops in different countries. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities for, for uh, networking, for uh, learning. And uh, so um, it's, uh, you can follow up all the, the calendar of activities with, from the Covenant of Mayors website. I would just like to highlight one thing here uh, as well. It's the webinars. So we have started uh, with, with webinars. There was just the uh, one last week on, on financing related to, to cohesion policy financing. So you're very much invited to have a look of, of those and follow up the, the website. And as my final slide, I just put uh, one on challenges. So um, we still have quite a bunch of challenges, even if, if uh, the Covenant of Mayors is very successful and, and, and we are very proud of, 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 of the initiative. We have to, uh, as mentioned, the monitoring framework is not yet finalized, so we have to work on this. And hopefully uh, early next year we will have the, the framework and kind of guidelines for, for submitting the implementation reports. We have an issue of with the geographical enlargement. There's already the Covenant East office in Lviv and Tbilisi in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, Georgia. So we work with, uh, with the uh, eastern part uh, border of Europe, let's say. But there are also other discussions of, of enlarging more work with Western Balkans and Mediterranean area. And finally, maybe in the future uh, to look at how we can use this excellent multi-governance model in some other areas than energy. Okay, this was from my part. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to. Thank listen. you so much. Uh, we'll now give the floor to our last speaker. Uh, and she's working at the Climate and Air team at Declay Europe, where she joined the air Climate and Air team in 2010. Um, she does a whole range of cool things, which you now will be talking about. Welcome. Thank you very much, Per. Thank you very much for, for all of you for having me here today. It's my good pleasure to introduce to you two very cool tools and uh, resources that we've been developing so far. So just a minute, I'll find my presentation. So as I was mentioning, my name is Giorgio Rambelli. I work as well for the ECLE European Se Secretariat. We are based in Freiburg in Germany and in the Climate and Air team. Uh, so first tool, the LIP wizard. So LIP stands for Local Energy Action Plan. And the main aim of this tool is basically to help you to look before you actually make your own LIP, before you make your jump into energy action planning. Just not take a chance, but do the things in a certain, with a certain uh, background, with knowing what other uh, countries, what other cities in other countries, local governments in other countries are doing. So the Leap Wizard wants to take your data that you have available, transfer them and make them become valuable information for you, that that will become a good base for building a good knowledge of your situation, and then maybe help you actually, we hope so, will help you to make the wisest decision for your communities. This mainly using suitable good practices available. So I'll give you a little bit of a background on this tool. This tool was developed uh, by another IE-funded project, Sustainable Now, and actually Climate Alliance was also a partner in this uh, project. And uh, it's an online, uh, online tool. It uh, has been developed mainly for decision making, so to support uh, your planning and to assist municipal action planning. So now, probably you will hear me using a lot the word cities, it's just 
for convenience is a short word, but uh, of course, I mean also every single size um, for a municipality that could be a city, could be a small city, or even a town. So what is the added value of this tool? The added value is that the tool tries to um, make it successful for your own um, context, for your own uh, kind of municipality, for the specific uh, features and access that your municipality has. How? Identifying what other good practices are available and what fits exactly your needs. Also, there is, of course, another great possibility out of this tool, which is not just uh, seeing what others are doing, but also promoting what you are doing. So the first invitation that I will start with today is please um, think about what are your best actions, what are your best practices, and share them with you, with us. Share them with, uh, with the others, with your peers, and help them in their local action planning. How does it work? So the cases and good practices that are in the wizard are all based on facts and figures. I'll then explain what I mean by uh, data, what exactly are the range of data that we are uh, referring to right now. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, you have this data. You have particular kind of uh, um, standards that are inserted at, uh, within this tool. And thanks to that, you can assess exactly according to the different parameters, which one are the one that can help you fit in your own uh, requirements, especially your environmental requirements and your context requirement. So there are three, basically three moves. Uh, first of all, uh, it helps you capture the usable information that you have. And those are not just uh, energy data, of course, but also environmental data the climate, for example, or political data, what is the, the different exchange of parties, for example, what is the different policies that have been uh, developed, and this, uh, for example, demographical data, how big is your city, that's definitely very important to us. The second move is the action, so you will have a, bright, a broad range of different actions on policy, technology, but also on people, so on stakeholder, stakeholder involvement, for example, and of course on financing. And you can see them as an overview or even zoom in in every specific details of it and even in the different steps of the action, giving you a better overview of what the best practice was about. And finally, the query wizard, which is the one that helps you set the priorities for your own action. And there are three general parameters, is financing, CO2 reduction, and technologies. And we'll suggest you automatically a selection of cases that must be helpful for you to plan your own action. The second tool instead that I'm going to talk to you about today is the toolbox for uh, local governments and their supporters. The aim of this toolbox, uh, well, first of all, is a repository tool online. It's a collection, basically, of all resources available. And uh, it tried to address um, the different steps of your sustainable energy action planning, from the getting started to the action planning to the implementation, monitoring, and, of course, reporting. But also, in the same time, it tries to address those different cross-cutting issues, which could be financing, technologies, for example, policy, really relevant, and stakeholders' involvement, so how your citizen can contribute to this. The main aim of the toolbox, of course, is to share these resources, but was to try to be as easy access as possible and to be as user-friendly as possible. This has been done through different strategies, which I'm going to explain to, to you now. How was the toolbox conceived, first of all? Uh, well, the background is another project, another IE project, Energy for Mayors. This afternoon we will have Ms. Badino introducing it to us, so I won't talk too much about it. Uh, basically, this was, is a project that is dedicated to covenant supporters and coordinators mainly, and to try to assess their needs and to try to help them overcome the barriers they encounter. So what was done in 2010 was to have a, a survey trying to understand what the needs are and what the needs of the communities that those supporters or potential supporters or coordinators are, uh, are facing. So we identified six different groups of uh, uh, needs, uh, going from SEP development examples, for example, or financial resources and SEP impl implementation, how to find them and so on. And um, we prepared a training package 
uh, for covenant support and coordinators. It's an interesting reading, although you are mostly from municipalities, I, it's an interesting reading and I recommend you to go on the toolbox itself and to try to look what was the assessment that we did after this survey. And uh, through these different six groups, we try to identify which methodologies and which tools would have been useful for you. So I was mentioning the different steps of the process, of course, those are reflected, and the different sectors that are also um, foreseen within the, within the toolbox. So adaptation, for example, transport, water, anything that is contributing to your sustainable energy action plan. So the, the first feature that we find that is user-friendly is actually the limited need for language. We tried to make, uh, to make a toolbox that was able uh, to transfer the knowledge as much as possible to everybody, not just who can speak English, of course. So f there is need for some text, obviously. But we try to select very um, eye-glancing kind of images, these little icons that you can see over there, try to, con try to convey the message of what each of them, uh, each of these topics mean, and to use them from uh, the entry point page to the search form to the back end where you upload the resource. And you easily can search just clicking on one of the icons and get all the results within the toolbox. Now, now, right now, we have over 906, and six, sorry, na, yes, 960 resources, so quite a few. Um, the second thing that we did was to add a help section, of course. The section um, features many things, one of which is an help sheet with translations. And the translation is in 10 languages, including Bulgarian. And, um, Italian, Catalan, Spanish, so a wide range. The search function I was mentioning, you can see there are the small icons, but there is also an, um, a long list of different criteria. Those are not all required. You can search easily just by using a keyword, or you can find a very specific toolbox, uh, a very specific resource in the toolbox with very specific criteria. So you have the choice. You can find something, you can look for something very, very, very spot on, or just take a look around and try to see what you can find that is um, fitting and useful for your community. There is another way to search, and it's with a list of methodologies. And uh, you can look alphabetically by language or by type. Great methodologies and tool. Uh, the idea was to share um, the best methodologies that are available. Uh, by best, we mean the ones that are recommended by you. So please. Second invitation of my presentation and of the day, please. Uh, take a look at the toolbox. Wander around, try to find if there is something useful for you and let us know, send us a feedback. Send us a feedback, send us a rating, for example. There is a very easy system for rating, one to five star, and we know which one are the most interesting resources for you. And the, in that way, we can look for similar things. And please, share your own resources, especially in your own language. That's really valuable. You can upload resources in every language and look for resources in every language. You will support directly all the other communities in your own country. This is the back end. Uh, I'm just trying to show you. Again, very detailed. You don't have to fill everything. And uh, there are guidance pop-up boxes. You just have to scroll with the mouse on top of the little question mark thingy. And you will have all the guidance that you need to understand which uh, kind of criteria you need to match when you're uploading your own resources. The second thing that we added to help the user is a frequent asked question session in the help section. So if you need more guidance there, you can find it or contact us, of course. Coming soon, a survey for registered users, so please register. <laughs> and uh, what is the added value of this survey for registered user? Well, we try to understand what you need. So through this survey, we will try to assess what you need and try to make it available. So you can use the toolbox without registering. You don't need to be registered. You can just take the resources that are there. It's fine. If you want to upload, you need to be registered. If you want to give a feedback, you, uh, you can actually do it without being registered. Still, it's really valuable for you to promote your own work as well and to share it and to make other people and other communities aware of what wonderful work you're doing. And last but not the least, we are going to add a top five recommended and COM resources, Covenant of Mayor's resources. This is just because we don't feel like we should uh, have a top five 
uh, by itself. I mean, some resources are really specific on a very specific topic that is applicable only for certain regions or for certain areas, but that doesn't mean that they are not as good. So we give recommended resources that we ideally will try to change every once in a while, just to get also an idea of what we have available there. So my invitation, please register, add your resources, comment and give us your feedback, rate them so we can know what is actually good and use it. It's a good tool. You can find a lot of very valuable things inside. For example, soon we will have the uh, Greenhouse Gas Inventory Toolkit. It's a basic toolkit. It will be for free. It's a eClay Europe um, production and that will be there. And you could just register and download it. So you see, methodologies, uh, guidelines, um, case studies, really, take a look. It's good. Please, if you have any comment or suggestion, uh, contact us. We are happy to know what you think about it, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Please have a seat, and uh, we should also welcome back on stage Marco and Perita. And I can get some help with moving the table here. You got your mics on. <coughs> so, Georgia, this session focused on the practical guidance um, with your background in international relations. What would you say would be the most often mis made mistake when trying to get support for a, a project? Well, um, what I think is sometimes uh, it's difficult to understand how local governments try. Uh, find difficult uh, to to, do, to see resources and great things implemented somewhere but they didn't really they don't really see it possible to happen in their own place and and this is a big limitation sometimes you you see wonderful things done for example in countries that are incredibly advanced and uh, you don't get the feeling that you can do the same thing you say okay well it's done there but what can i do i mean my economic situation, my political situation doesn't allow me to act like that. And that's often a mistake because there are very good things done also in places that you wouldn't think about. It's just that often people don't share enough. So I would say probably is that it's the exchange. Um, we should connect more. We should connect more and share more what we are doing and, and try also to promote ourselves because uh, many local governments are doing great work. They just don't promote it enough. So that would be my recommendation. Would you agree with that, Prita? Yes, totally. And there are um, in some countries, it's it's kind of it becomes more naturally to to promote. In some other countries, it doesn't. So, so it's also I, I would also invite everyone to promote their activities and and also yeah show what is what good actions they are doing and then also learning of course from the others. Marke, what would you say would be the reason for people not sharing more, giving your extensive experience in this field? Well. Um, I have to say that that is a problem that I see uh, very often. Um, working with different community, with different local governments, we see that the problems, the issues, the challenges are basically the same, especially for local governments in the same country or even in the same region, but also all over Europe. There are some common challenges and problems that can be faced by networking. And why they don't do it? Um, well, Oftentimes, they, well, lack of time is one thing. I mean, every day you work takes up a lot of time, so you don't take the time to share because you think that, oh, well, you have to focus on your things. Mm. And then the second is that not all, not everybody understands how useful it can be to share and basically to get feedback on what you're doing. Mm. Um, so that is something that we promote. We're also engaged in another IE-funded project that is promoting a conurbation approach with the main city and the little towns around in the surroundings working together. That is helping very much. Padova is leading um, one of these conurbations and the work is actually very good. And now little ta smaller towns are gathering around the larger city uh, to get support, technical support, um, fin not financial support, but financial aggregation, and that is working. So now, you're, just, you're, 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 now you're sliding into sort of the success factor, and that's good. What other success factor would you add? I mean, we had it working together, asking the, just the peers behind uh, around you. 
what more success, success factors might there be? Well, um, another success factor that could be added, but well, Marika mentioned that large cities um, are strong. They have technical uh, expertise, they have financial, um, well, financial opportunities that smaller towns don't have. Networking between small and big is important, not just between peers. Mm. Ah. That, so cities Finding can a really... Finding sibling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Britta, in your view, what would be another success factor to get things going? Yes. Well, of course, the, the I think what we've been discussing here is a lot about, you know, how to get started. This is, of course, one of the the key issues. I mean, um, once starting a process like Covenant of Mayors, it's not, it's more than a signature or commitment of the political representative, even if that is, of course, very crucial to have the political support. But then you also need to to know <coughs> how do you start your work. So it's very important to to have this um, sort of into the daily work. So it has to be somehow integrated in in your local authority, in your day-to-day -day business. You start doing something where there's a, also a European dimension and then you have to, by learning, by doing, you have to network, you have to, to, yeah, to open your mind to such a process, I think. So make it, making sure it does, doesn't be a project that sort of sits alongside the rest of the daily yeah. activities. Yes, but it has to be linked with the daily uh, activities. Otherwise, it there will not not be resources to to do it. I so mean, the local authority needs to see energy action planning and 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 the climate and energy as an important key factor of of, of a success factor for the local authority. I think. With your sort of helicopter view, sitting in Brussels and getting all over the place, where what would you say would be the most common questions you get from cities on on how to start it? Um, I, I almost wanted to make a joke that the most jokes are fine. Jokes <laughs> are fine <yeah. laughs> most among friends ask here. questions that, that can I extend my my deadline for <laughs> for submitting a sustainable energy action plan, but because it's a very very tight deadline, the yeah. one year um, after signature. So, what is important is also that um, uh, once signing, there has been a kind of a reflection of what does it require to to prepare an action plan. So it's you sign first, and then you understand why you signed. Yeah. Well, you okay. have to first uh, reflect, so yeah. and I would also invite everyone to yeah to think. Okay, it's a big job. It's it's great. It's an adventure, but you know. It needs a bit of um, uh, of reflection of, of and issues related that you also mentioned, like resources and and uh, responsible people and uh, responsible departments and working with different departments. So it's it's a big task and uh, yeah. Georgia, is that is that why you started with these toolboxes and sort of getting people to understand why they sign? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's, what's happening after the signature? Well, um, absolutely. Uh, that's one of the components. And uh, another component, as they were mentioning, is definitely to try to involve everybody in the process. Yeah. Because it's not just difficult to have peers to exchange, but also sometimes people within the same cities, department within the same city to, to exchange on what they are their ideas. And also involving all the citizens. I mean, this toolbox is free. Everybody can uh, can take a look and just uh, look around at what's, what's available. And definitely if you start to make your citizen even working even with university or with the research centers and you make them aware them aware of what you want to do uh it's definitely more easy so do you find there's uh, some differences between different countries signing on here is, is there a, could we see a cultural differences in the or i think there is a cultural difference um let's say that for some well First of all, the language difference, that, that's clear. And yeah. uh, some countries are more easy in finding resources in English and have access much more easily to them because they are available in English. Some others instead have a real problem with that. Yeah. And that was one of the things that led us to use icons, for example, instead of wording, and led us to try to promote, especially to other countries, to upload their own resources in other languages, because there is a lack. Of and beyond the language, do you see that the different cities that sort of in the cities of France are better than the cities of Germany when it comes to submitting or when it comes to questions they ask? Or can you see a cultural difference in that respect as well? I wouldn't say it's better or worse. I would say that they have different, uh, yeah, maybe different l level, for example, of how the resources advanced. Okay, for oh. example, 
Denmark, for example, uh, it's very advanced. So mm. of course they wouldn't ask for startup questions. That that's definitely true. Um, but overall, I wouldn't say that there is. I mean, no question is better than another one. Yeah. Usually people that comes to uh, come to us and ask us questions because they are very interested and very committed. So. I would say there is not better. Mark, have you noticed these differences between different regions or different countries that you can say that this is a clear one? Well, mm, well, in Italy we are very good at signing the covenant of mayors, <laughs> 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 and I guess numbers speak um, aloud about that. Uh, I guess Spanish municipalities are also quite good at signing, and that is one thing. And in our uh, daily work, we see and uh, we support a lot of municipalities that signed without knowing exactly what they were doing. But I think this is more of an, General an, thing. an Italian thing, maybe a Spanish thing. I wouldn't be able to say that about other countries. We like to think that in uh, Central and Northern European countries, they sign less because mm. they're more afraid to commit to such mm. uh, an important and complicated uh, goal to reach. Um, but that is one thing. And then, um, of course, um, well, the legal framework is also uh, different in some cases. So in some countries, they have been uh, planning energy use uh, much more than we have. And, and, and I see that when I, uh, when I talk, discuss and work with partners from other countries. I see that they actually work with municipalities that have a different background. They have different uh, monitoring tools. They have different data. They can actually go back with a baseline emission inventory uh, mm. from the 80s, from the 90s, while we have trouble in going back to 2006 or 2005. Um, so there are differences in their cultural differences, and there are also co differences that are integrated in, 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 in the, let's say, legal framework in the... Um, and the things that local governments have been doing in the past 10, 20, 30 years. So that does I mean make it, it is indeed an, an important and complicated task, and, and it's daunting once you get into it and understand all the plant that's needed and all the sort of you have to identify the, the, the um, what's going to be measured and so forth. George, I know that you're an avid cartoonist and you're <laughs> able to draw a caricature of people in fairly short time. So, how important is this uh, topic of humor in this? Are we getting too serious in this? Our children, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't know about serious, but definitely the coolness is a great component and a very important one. Um, people are really in a hurry all the time. The time issue, Marco was mentioning, and uh, you need to have a message that captures attention. Yeah. So, yes, a laugh could actually be a good way to go. Absolutely. I mean, uh, are we killing projects because they are being too long and too boring? I mean, sometimes being in a hurry is also good. I think... Um, yeah, you, we don't get, let's put it in that way, we don't get the most out of them. No. If we were maybe more immediate, more even easy to, easier to understand, I don't know, sometimes, uh, yeah, definitely could help to improve our outreach. I th I think, how important do you think it's sort of the component of making it fun and, and easy? Very important. Actually, um, uh, well, if I could do some self-criticism here, I think uh, one of the issues maybe within the covenant is that it's uh, we are following the the kind of there's still the the institutional background and sometimes things are quite um, yeah complicated and and uh, and we are working very hard to to streamline procedures to to make the make, making sustainable energy action plan as plans and implementing sustainable energy action plans something very much interesting for and, and rewarding for, for local authorities. Because, I mean, I would always like to say that the, the, this is like, it's an advantage. There are a lot of opportunities in, in energy related actions, so we should use those and, and maybe not get too much stuck on some, some, some details of relation to, to procedures. How good are we at learning f uh, failing well in this? Failing well means that you learn from failures and then you can move on, so it's okay to fail. What's the, what, what failure have you seen that you've learned the most from? Um, I think we are quite um, adaptive, I would say. So indeed, uh, learning by doing Covenant is a, is a huge uh, project, or I wouldn't say project, a huge initiative which has never 
been done before. So of course there are a lot of uh, factors that we learn by doing. So uh, yes, but do you feel that there's uh, that cu culture of sort of failing and then moving on and learning on? Well, uh, maybe um, yes. I wouldn't say maybe failing, but indeed we try to pinpoint the problematic issues and and try to 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 move forwards even beyond even before you fail you mean yes <laughs> that would be the ideal situation at least <laughs> mark what's your best failure well um my best failure yeah <laughs> what have you experienced in this <laughs> um well uh, we in within the um developing of baseline emission inventories uh, we approached utilities in the wrong way, I guess, at the beginning. We um, we had troubles at the beginning finding um, gas and power data mm -hmm. and getting them from utilities uh, because we knew that there was a legal framework, that it was in a certain way, that we wanted data in a certain way, and uh, we were not very good at telling utilities what we needed and why. We just went for the legal boundaries and we asked for that. And uh, that didn't work much. We, we got a kind of a wall. So what uh, did you learn and how did you get around that wall? Well, we're still in the process of getting around, but uh, while climbing a bit and sneaking around, um, we are actually getting better results because we're not so pushy. Um, and uh, we are actually... A more proposing cooperation. We're inviting them to to local forums and um, considering them as stakeholders. And uh, also we accept data in whichever format they give us. And but we understood how to process it and and uh, and understand it and use it. So we, we are finding kind of a, a compromise, which is not still a win-win situation as we would like. To be and we will talk about that in the afternoon as well with Maraike. But it was a failure at the beginning, and now it's becoming sort of a success. What failure have you learned from? Well, um, I'm still in a very uh, optimistic uh, kind of uh, perspective. So f in this you, period you, you, that I've been working on, I actually don't see it anything as a specific failure. I see more as a struggle. So I can tell you what is the best struggle uh, that I've been learning from. Yep. The best struggle I is definitely try to make everybody understand, and by everybody I, I mean civil society, yes, but mainly even national government sometimes, the importance of involving cities and communities in uh, their action planning and the reduction of emissions. Uh, cities are really relevant, but somehow sometimes even at the the, the international level, let's say, um, sometimes they forget to ask uh, enough the opinions of local communities and local governments. So that's probably the, the best struggle that I learned from. Thank you so much for sharing your struggles and sharing your perspective. We've all learned from it. And so thank you. We want to offer you some candy, uh, which I'll give you. It's locally produced and it's fair trade here from Malmö. Uh, we'll get that to you shortly. Uh, thank you so much. It's now time for our networking lunch. And I have some guidelines for you that you have to obey with. Uh, first of all, you can't eat with someone you've met before. Uh, and secondly, you have to start your conversation with the question, what's your passion? Let's meet here at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>